The argument that the Constitution is pro-slavery rests on the parts of the Constitution that deal with slavery and support the interests of the slave owners and slave states. Okay? So it's the part about the fugitive about fugitive slaves being returned to the owner, owners, the part about counting three-fifths of the slaves for the purpose of representation in congressional elections, and also for the purpose of um, assigning electors in, in the electoral college and presidential elections. Uh, and then on top of those two clear references to slavery or, or to, to the interests of slave owners and slave states, some also argue that other sections were pro-slavery as well, but the case is tenuous. I, I, I wouldn't recommend taking it seriously. Um, for example, clauses guaranteeing various rights, privileges, and immunities to citizens, and by implications deny them from non-citizens, are not unique to slave republics. Okay, these are common in, in republics. Um, likewise, there is no reason to assume that the militia clause at some point to, uh, that, it, that its discussion of domestic insurrection was a veiled reference to slave revolts in particular. After all, domestic rebellions were common in both slave and non-slave societies. Moreover, um, it was Shays' rebellion, a domestic rebellion that was not a slave rebellion, not in a slave state. You know, it, was, it took place in Massachusetts in Massachusetts uh, in 1786, when Massachusetts was already a free state. Um, so uh, Shays' Rebellion figured uh, very prominently in the Federalist campaign, uh, campaign to craft a new federal constitution. Okay, so it's not surprising that domestic insurrections would be on their minds, not necessarily slave insurrections, but citizens uprisings, just like Shays' Rebellion and other rebellions that took place before the American Revolution. Again, citizens' rebellions. Um, so we're left with, number one, the, the, the three-fifths compromise, two, the fugitive slave clause, and Three, the fact that the federal constitution did not outlaw slavery or the slave trade. Okay, so these three issues are, uh, are, are serious ones that are counted as evidence that the constitution was pro-slavery, you know, that it addressed the, the concerns of slave owners and slave states. Uh, all of these were, con all three of these were consequences of the fact that the constitution was a framework for mutual governor, uh, governance for five free states and eight slave states. Okay. That this was the count at the time of the um, writing of the Constitution, of the federal Constitution. Okay. This kind of marriage between five free states and eight slave states by necessity created a mutual govern, uh, government that reflected the wishes, tastes, uh, and interests and, and concerns of both free and slave states. The way the framers secured this difficult union was to create a federal government of limited powers, meaning a federal government that had no jurisdiction to, no authority to govern the domestic affairs of individual states. Okay, so it's true that the federal government did not force abolition on the slave states, but it also did not force slavery on the free states, which were a minority at the time. Okay. Had the federal government been empowered to govern the domestic affairs of the states, the majority of slave states would have been able to force slavery on the minority of free states. So it's no coincidence that the federal constitution created a government without any jurisdiction on slavery within the states. 
The result of this was that states remained free to change the status of slavery within their borders. Okay? Free states could adopt slavery and slave states could become free states, which some did. New York and New Jersey um, you know, be became voluntarily became free states a few years later, plus the new states established in the West. Also, some of them chose slavery, others chose uh, non-slavery. Moreover, the Constitution permitted the U.S. Congress to outlaw the slave, uh, the slave trade and to ban slavery from U.S. territories governed by the national government, both of which Congress did in quick order. So, uh, so again, the question should, should not be whether the Constitution was pro or anti-slavery. Okay? When you have a marriage of free and slave states, then there's no doubt that this union would allow slavery to exist and allow anti-slavery to exist. Otherwise, there'd be no marriage. The result of such a marriage, again, as long as both parties enter the marriage voluntarily rather than by coercion and force, is a live and let live approach to slavery. Each state will govern its internal affairs on this front. That's how to understand the Constitution's uh, you know, failure, you know, their inability or, or unwillingness, or the, the fact that it did not abolish slavery in the slave states, and the fact that it did not enforce slavery on the free states. Okay, so there, there was a failure to abolish slavery, in this, but, but, but also you could see from the other direction, there was a failure of the majority of slave states to enforce slavery on the free states. Okay, so that's how to, um, you know, the, the, you need to remember that this is a marriage of free and slave states in which the free states are a minority. That's how to understand this failure to coerce the other to follow my method, my, my, my system of labor relations. Uh, and it's how to understand the Fugitive Slave Act uh, or the Fugitive Slave Clause. Since the majority of the states defined slaves as property, they required assurances from the other side, from the, slave, from the free states, that their rights of property would be honored by the minority of states that did not recognize slaves as property. Okay, so we might, we today uh, do not agree with slavery, but we can all understand that no slave state would join a union that would encourage slaves to, free from, to, to, uh, to, to flee from their masters across the border to a free state. Uh, and, and, and the other element, the, the three-fifths compromise, likewise should be understood in this context of this marriage. Okay? So it's true that it catered to the worries of slave states, but again, um, we have a choice on whether to see this compromise as the glass you know, uh, half empty or half full addressing the interests of slave states or addressing the interests of free states, okay? Because while, while Northern states wanted no slaves counted for the purpose of appropriating congressional seats and electoral college seats, Southern states wanted all slaves counted, okay? And so what they did was to split, uh, to split the baby in two, okay? The, um, the point of this, of, of, of all this discussion, is that when people criticize the federal constitution for being pro slavery, they should acknowledge that the alternative was not an anti slavery federal constitution, but rather no federal constitution, no, no federal union. Okay, the alternative was to stick with the status quo of the Articles of Confederation. Any union between five free states and eight slave states demanded a constitution that would accommodate at least some of the wishes and fears of both free 
and slave states, which is what the Constitution did. So on the issue of slavery in the Constitution, we can see the glass as half empty or half full. It's our choice whether to see, to, 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 to see this arrangement as half empty or half full. And the big question behind this whole debate then is why do those who see it half empty choose to see it that way? And why do the others choose to see it as half full? And the answer has to do with the person making the choice. You know, that today in 2021, um, you know, the, the, the choice of seeing it half full or half empty is in the eye of the beholder, okay? It has to do with the way people today in 2021 think rather than with the people who drafted the constitution 230 years ago. Okay? So if you are unimpressed with anti-slavery Americans, people in the free states in the late 18th century, you know, if your mindset is, you know, ah, too little, too late, I'm not impressed by it, then you're unimpressed with the constitution they created and you see it as half empty. If on the other hand, you're impressed with the ability of anti-slavery Americans to question and overturn moral assumptions that their civilization and their religion and all of humanity upheld for thousands of years, then you're bound to also be impressed with their accomplishments and thus see the glasses half full. Um, I, I studied under a professor by the name of uh, Michal Sobel in undergrad and under David Brian Davis in graduate school. And I remember them pointing out how impressive it was that in less than a hundred years of, um, of, of in, that within a hundred years of the very first anti-slavery publication, most Americans, North and South, came to see slavery as morally and religiously repugnant. So for 5,000 years of legal and moral and religious teaching to be washed away in an instant, in 100 years, by the power of an idea that was virtually non-existent beforehand, um, I remember it was astounding to me. Okay, so no doubt Americans in the North where slavery was less pronounced found it easier to abolish slavery in their midst than did Americans in the South. But even in the South, slave owners manumitted their slaves by the, uh, uh, liberated their slaves by the, by, by the thousands after the American Revolution. And many Southerners acknowledged that slavery was a moral and political problem. It's only later on in the early 19th century, towards the mid 19th century, after the Cotton Revolution, that the, defense, uh, that the defenses of slavery as a positive moral and religious and political good uh, emerged in America. So, um, so, so when you consider whether we should denounce the slave, the, the, the Constitution as pro as pro slavery, um, I think you need to remind yourself. Well, I'll, I'll say it this way: I remind myself that those people lived in 1787, not in 2021, and. I remind myself uh, not to chastise people in different cultures for failing to conform to my own culture, my values, my beliefs. Um, but you know, that said, if you think of it, to the degree that I want people in that other culture to conform to my own cultural values about slavery, I'm actually quite impressed with the progress of anti-slavery sentiment in America at that time. And I see these anti-slavery sentiments reflected in the constitution. Okay, let's not forget that Americans in uh, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Vermont abolished slavery in their societies before 
other, before any other Western society did. And more important than who did it first, they were the only ones who abolished slavery in their own midst voluntarily, okay, rather than being instructed to do so from above, as was the case in the British and French slave colonies, or later on in the US, um, in, in the American South, where it was in order from the government to do so, rather than a voluntary decision. And, and if you think of it, those, uh, the, the, the anti-slavery of those Americans in the Northern states uh, becomes even more impressive when you remind yourself that these were racist societies. Okay? For them to liberate an enslaved race of people that they saw as inferior or even savage, okay? so the, the, they liberate they liberated these, um, um, these people in their midst, despite their own interest, their, their own economic interest, despite their own prejudice, and, and, and despite their own racism, and despite precedent, and despite law, and despite habit. Okay, that's a tremendously impressive compliance with the moral and religious principles that they developed about, um, uh, about slavery and liberty. Okay, abolishing, uh, abolishing slavery when the slaves are your kind, okay, that they share your culture, your circumstances, your, your, your look, your race, your et cetera, um, is, is one thing. Abolishing slavery when the slaves are the other is quite another and, um, and, and actually a pretty impressive application of moral principle. And, and one last thing, you know, if, if we are going to hold people in history accountable for not living up to our standards on the issue of slavery, then we also have to hold ourselves accountable. If we chastise Americans in 1787 for doing too little too late, then, you know, then let's see how well we live up to our own anti-slavery standards. Okay? We live in a world in which slavery is much weaker than it was back then. And a world in which, uh, a, a world um, that is much, much, much more receptive to anti-slavery ideas and anti-slavery actions. Okay, so the question is, what are we today doing to abolish slavery? Okay. Are we doing more than they did in their time or are we doing less? Okay. And I think most fair observers would acknowledge that we do less. Okay. That, that, that our record on, uh, on, on fighting or speaking against and, and, and uh, removing slavery and, and, and putting pressure to, to, to discontinue slavery where it exists is in fact much weaker than theirs. Okay, so I, I don't say this in order to uh, shame critics of the constitution into, into uh, shutting up. I say it in the hope of sparking some introspection and empathy for 18th century Americans. Okay, so if, if we today in a world in which slavery is much less entrenched in our societies and much less central to our, to our economy, you know, a world that applauds and rewards anti-slavery ideas and, and actions, if we do so little to combat slavery in this environment, then maybe we can appreciate how hard it was to act against slavery in the 1780s. And then we might appreciate the gains that they made back then as a glass half full, or even more than half full, rather than seeing it as half empty.